Hello, this is Josh Poet, First Contact Radio, and I have another guest today. This is Trisha McCannon. You've heard her here before on First Contact Radio and other stations and networks across the world. Um, She is back from her visit to Chichen Itza for the 2012 December 21st experience, and she... Last time she was here, she was talking about the mysteries. She's an author of a number of books we're going to talk about. Anyway, let's get on to uh, talking with Trisha. Trisha, welcome to First Contact Radio. Thanks for being here again. How are you? Oh, Josh, it's always a wonderful thing to do your show. I so enjoy it, and thank you again for having me back on. You're absolutely right that, you know, here we are in 2013. A lot of us never even believed we'd make it here. And uh, I was one of those keynote speakers that went down to um, Chichen Itza at the Temple of or the Pyramid of Kukla Khan or Quetzalcoatl in the Mayan lands for this uh, famous um, Synthesis 2012 event that was celebrating the change of the 5,125-year Mayan calendar that is moving from one age to another age. So I was down there really all before Christmas. I got, I literally flew back to Atlanta where I live on Christmas Eve night. So it was quite an experience. Sounds like it was really awesome. Yeah, I don't know how many people were there. I would guess there were at least 50,000. But, you know, they didn't all stay there. Many people came down and they spent a few days in Cancun. And so the morning of the 20, 21st or the 22nd, you know, uh, uh, people who were staying there, we began ceremony at 6.30 or 7 in the morning with shamans and the indigenous people. And um, we kind of had the place to ourselves until about noon when some of the tour buses started arriving. And um, then there were, you know, wave after wave after wave. And I think I stayed till about 3 or 4 on the 21st. But it's still such a big place that it was, even though there were lots of people, it was never crowded. You'd see circles of people dressed in white. Our group from Census 2012 conference put on by Michael D. Martinez, we dressed in white and did all sorts of prayer and dance and ceremony and smudging and sage. We had shamans like Hunbat's men there and um, one named Oro and a number of other elders, Mayan elders, that had come for the event. But there were also amazing musicians and dancers that had come from around the world, um, speakers like myself. I think Nikki Scully was there. Uh, she's written some books on, on Egypt, and um, uh, Hunbat's men spoke, as I said, uh, And it was just, it was a really wonderful, amazing event. I was so honored to be there. And I was with people from Finland, from um, England, from Germany, uh, from Canada, from America. Uh, It was a real international event. They came from everywhere. There were about a 1,000 people at the conference. So uh, it was really a gathering of light workers from around the world. Awesome. What was really neat about the experience from my perspective was being able to see that World Unity 2012 uh, TV was broadcasting not only that location, but 39 other locations around the globe. So it was really cool. I got to see you do your talk out there and and a lot of other people did. And so that was awesome. Well, I, I love that. And I want to say also my friend J.J. Hurtak, who wrote The Keys of Enoch, he mm-hmm. he was um, he had a conference going on in Cancun with his uh, Future uh, uh, Paradigms um, Institute, Alan Steinfeld, mm-hmm. who's a wonderful friend of mine in New York who has New Realities TV. He was there. Deborah Moldav from the World Peace Prayer Society, who is the liaison with the U.N., she was there, and uh, of course Desiree, JJ Hertek's wife. So, and I think there were about a half a dozen people that recorded um, a video of the six of us each speaking about what was going on. And I have no idea if that's up on YouTube, but hopefully it makes it. Awesome. So here's the big question. Then I want to ask you: December twenty first came and went. The there is multiple versions of what was going to happen on that day. One of them was the Hollywood version, 
and a lot of people believed the Hollywood version, and when the world wasn't destroyed, a lot of those people just figured it was a big hoax, and that was the end of it. However, for those paying attention, we know that there was something that happened, a shift that happened. So what I'd like to to focus on and and talk to you about are some of the places now that we've gone since December 21st with the new beginning of this new cycle. Where are we going? Where is our energy going? What are the things that we need to do as we begin this new cycle? That's a really great question. And, you know, it is interesting. I get emails from people all around the world uh, every day uh, at Tricia McCannon uh, Speaks at Yahoo.com. That's one of my emails. Um, if our listeners are interested in emailing. But I did get emails from people that were like, oh, my gosh, we're still here. What happened? They like they somehow thought this whole thing, exactly as you said, was going to be the total end of the world. Well, right. I think in truth, coming up to it, nobody knew what was going to happen. I think this is the honest truth. We did not know whether or not it would signal an actual day of a pole shift or a meteor shower or um, some kind of celestial activity or a solar mass ejection from the sun that could, you know, fire our electrical grids. The truth was it was a mystery, and the truth is that we are still in the mystery. However, I think to just give us some ground to stand upon, it helps to talk about the actual science of what is going on right now. And, uh, you know, I speak all over the world about the great spiritual mysteries and what the masters taught, uh, the lost years of Jesus and his secret teachings, uh, I'm a clairvoyant and a clairaudient. I've had visitations from angels and masters and higher dimensional beings since I was a little girl. And I've done over 6,000 readings for people all around the world, as well as numerous levels of healing because I'm trained as a hypnotherapist and uh, in voice dialogue and holographic repatterning and all of these things that help people to release the things that are blocking them and helping them to you know, kind of get to what their life's mission is. So this is just a little bit of background for the listeners that don't know anything about me. But um, okay. I'm writing actually a new book about this whole galactic alignment. And so the science behind it is very important. What actually happens is that we have something called the precession of the equinoxes. And the ancients within the mystery schools called it the great year. It basically is the period of time, 25,920 years, that it takes that uh, if we're on planet Earth at the spring equinox, which is March 23rd, and we watch the sunrise and we see what is the celestial backdrop behind the sun, um, it's obviously one of the 12 signs of the zodiac. That's what the zodiac is. It's the flat Mm -hmm. elliptical plate. They call it the ecliptic upon which all the planets in our solar system move like a, you know, like a record player. So over a period of time, the celestial backdrop begins to shift. And instead of shifting forward so that the 12 astrological ages are like you see them in the newspaper when you read your horoscope, they precess backwards. So it, it, since the sun appears to move one degree every 72 years, And if you take 12 into the 360 degrees of a circle, 12 signs into 360, that means each one of these astrological signs is about 30 degrees fat or wide. So if you do the math, 30 degrees times 72 years, you come up with each astrological age being 2,160 years. If you multiply that by 12 signs or 12 ages, then you have the great year, which is, we can say, roughly 26,000 years, but to be specific, it's 25,920 years. So we, of course, have been in the age of Pisces, and we're moving into the age of Aquarius. So that in itself is an exciting thing, but there's far more to this celestial clock that we move in a large cycle, not just around, but in regard to the galaxy or the galactic equator, we drop below the galactic equator for 13,000 years, and then we cross the galactic equator moving up. And then like a big sine wave, we move above the galactic equator for 13,000 years, and then we begin to drop down, and 13,000 years later, we fall below the galactic equator. So when 
the continent of Atlantis, you know, crashed and burned in the big way, that was about 11,500 years ago. And we know, scientists tell us, geologists, that the water table all over the planet rose some 400 feet in about a month. So obviously something catastrophic happened that suddenly melted the poles or made the land go down and the water levels rise. So we can see that geologically. So this is when we fell below the galactic equator. Well, obviously since we started crossing through it 13,000 years ago and the fall didn't happen until 11,500 years, it took 1,500 years before there was a disaster, a physical disaster and a pole shift. But okay. uh, we're in a similar place now, except instead of falling below the galactic equator, where we fall into the density of real kind of third-dimensional dualistic thinking, we begin to move above the galactic equator. So what, is two, what was 2012? There are several answers to that. It was the midpoint of our 1,000 years or 900 years of passing through the center of the galaxy. In other words, if you think of the galaxy as a horizontal line and our solar system as a vertical line, this creates the solar cross, the celestial cross. Our sun is, of course, the local solar energy, but our sun winds up um, aligning with the center of the galaxy and the center of the galaxy is connected with basically like, let us say, the great central sun. We can think of it as the great galactic computer in the sky. So this galactic sun sends down uh, new energetic codes to the center of our galaxy. Our galaxy sends it out to our sun and any other solar systems that happen to be crossing the galactic equator. And then our sun sends it out to all the planets in the solar system. And part of what the sun sends out is that, the, the, that all the planets reverse their poles. So when we're below the galactic equator, the north pole is the way that we've known it, the south pole is the way that we've known it. But then when we cross over it, the poles begin to melt, the ice sheets melt as we're seeing today, and the northern polarity points turn to southern, the southern turn to northern, and when the balance is tipped, then we do have a pole shift, and the poles are literally going to reverse because we're going to be uh, at a different polarity level. So where we are now in 2013 is we're in the suspended animation place, and what I mean by that is that uh, when we were below the galactic equator, clearly the North Pole and the South Pole were what they are. Now we're in the place where the magma whirls inside of the planet that normally spin, counter, spin clockwise have now reversed, and they are going counterclockwise. This means ultimately several things. We're going to have a pole shift, whether it's in three months, three years, 30 years, 300 years. You know, it's probably more like three to 30 years because we can see how fast the poles are melting. But no one knows exactly when that's going to take place. And this is pure science. Uh, there was a whole uh, wonderful show on NOVA uh, about this, gosh, 10 years ago. And then they yanked it, I guess, because they didn't want to alarm people. But this is just, you know, without any esoteric anything, this is the pure science behind it. Now, when the, when the planet since the internal magma uh, normally spins clockwise and our planet spins clockwise, the question becomes when our magma begins to spin counterclockwise, what is that going to do to our planet? Well, ultimately, I think what it will do is it will stop us and then we're going to begin to reverse and spin counterclockwise. Now, Historically, when you go back and study the mysteries, and so many of these records, of course, got destroyed with the Library of Alexandria that had 700,000 books and scrolls, and of course the, the Muslims and the Christians both burned that incredible repository of knowledge. But there still are records that talk about the fact that there is a time when the sun rises in the west and sets in the east, 
and a time when the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So how do we know this? If if you go back to ancient uh, Egypt, um, at the very last, you know, there's the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, the new kingdom, and then the last of the kings of Egypt or pharaohs were the Ptolemaic kings, and these were the the uh, the kings of the pharaohs that came from Greece. If you remember Philip uh, of Macedonia that had Alexander the Great, and Alexander, if you ever saw that movie, Alexander, Alexander turns to his friend Ptolemy, one of his generals, and says, when this is all over, what country do you want, Ptolemy? And Ptolemy says, I want Egypt. So he says, okay. So after Alexander died and Persia and the other spoils of war were divided up by his generals, Ptolemy got Egypt. So the last of the kings of Egypt were Ptolematic, and uh, Cleopatra, for example, was the very last one. So the second of the Ptolemies, which I think was Ptolemy Philadelphus, and this is probably about oh, 270, 290 B.C., he asked the high priest um, Manasso uh, at the temple of Heliopolis. Helio is the sun. Polis means city. That's a Greek name, Heliopolis. The Egyptians called it the city of On, which is mentioned in the Bible. He asked this high priest to go and get the king's list of how old Egypt actually was. And Manasso brought back these very careful records that said that ancient Egypt went back some 36,000 years. For 12,000 years, the gods ruled. For 18,000 years, the demigods ruled, half uh, immortals and half mortals. And that the humans got to rule from about 3114 B.C. on, which is when the Mayans say that that last age that just ended first began. So this is when we think Egyptian history started. We sort of have conveniently discarded the gods and the demigods, and we only pick up with recording the humans. But during that period of 36,000 years, according to the records, the poles had reversed four times and that the sun had risen in the west, set in the east, and then risen in the east and set in the west. So, of course, we hard, it's hard to know exactly when it happened, but we understand that shortly before the um, fall of Atlantis, this pole reversal did take place and uh, the sun uh, shifted position. So, you know, this is not something we're not going to survive. Uh, we've obviously survived it many times in the past, but uh, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. Uh, is it only a magnetic pole shift? Does none of the land move? Um, so, you know, that might be much easier. For example, we now know that the magnetic north has moved nine degrees towards Siberia, and so Siberia is now getting 18 feet of snow. That means that places like Atlanta are going to be more temperate. They're going to be hotter. And this is exactly what we've seen. We've had milder winters and we've had warmer summers. But this is only a nine-degree shift. And we're probably going to have a much more severe shift before it's all over. But hopefully it will move in these sort of incremental stages. And that will be a whole lot less catastrophic for everybody, don't you think? I think so, yes, absolutely. We don't want it to flip all of a sudden. So the science behind this is that as these poles have been shifting, as you notice the last 20 years, we've had a lot of beach whales, beach dolphins, the migration patterns of birds have changed. All this is because every creature down here has magnets, tiny magnets in their brain. And the creatures that are more sensitive to this, like the whales that are able to swim the song lines as the Maori uh, um, indigenous people call them, the song lines are the ley lines of the earth, you know, um, they uh, started showing up with this disorientation to the magnetic north and south long before us. Now, of course, humans who have this ability at a much uh, more subtle level to feel these shifts, the way we're experiencing it is dizziness. Uh, changes in our sleep patterns, waking up in the middle of the night, um, uh, feeling like we're tired a lot, that we need to sleep a lot, and then, you know, uh, 
conversely, you know, when we go to sleep, sometimes waking up uh, and not being able to go back to sleep. Um, the dizziness is a big thing. I, I did a radio interview last week with a, a doctor um, who interviewed me. And she said that since September, she had had nonstop patients coming up in complaining of dizziness, thinking it was something medically wrong. And it's not that there's anything wrong with the people. It's that the sensitivity of the magnets in their brain, as we're now sort of in the center or midpoint of the shift, we're neither below it or really above it. Um, For a while, and nobody knows how long, is it going to be months or is it going to be years? Um, We don't actually know. Uh, But it's causing people to have... um, a loss of balance, dizziness, and it's also the, the what's happening is this increase in sunspot activity that's coming to the sun is affecting our pineal gland. The pineal gland, as you know, sits at the center of the brain and it regulates our melatonin or sleep hormones, our serotonin or happiness hormones, and our um, um, our DMT. Uh, The brain naturally secretes something called DMT, uh, which is normally neutralized by the stomach uh, acids or or enzymes. DMT is the psychotropic substance in things like ayahuasca and peyote and uh, mescaline that allows us to pull back the veils and see uh, through the dimension, to see into the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension. So by having our DMT levels increased, what it means is that this very rare window of opportunity, whether it lasts a few months or longer, is an opportunity to have very powerful meditations, to make contact with the spiritual worlds, to take time to go inside, to do healing work, to tune in to who you really, really are as a soul, which is something that I see all the time in my readings where I'm able to uh, go into these higher states of consciousness and track the origin of the soul from the highest angelic levels. And also to discover uh, in the beauty of who that soul is how the soul has been wounded over the course of time because most of us just in this lifetime can speak to the fact that, you know, we've had uh, wounding, whether it was through dysfunctional families or relationships or whatever, or traumas. Well, imagine multiplying whatever trauma you've had in this lifetime by many, many, many lifetimes, uh, some of which, of course, are not healed. So a lot of the healing work that I do with people at a personal level has to do with doing readings for them, whether on the phone or in person, about who they are at the highest angelic level, what their journey has been to time, what the gifts and abilities are they've acquired, the lessons that they've learned, the themes that they've been dealing with, and where they might be stuck or blocked along the way. And then the healing work I do has to do with helping them to get unstuck. So this period of time is a perfect window for people to go in and heal these old issues that have been percolating in their subconscious and creating problems for them in their lives. It's it's just kind of a perfect time for that. It it definitely seems like that. What it feels like is having closed out a cycle and we're at the beginning of a new cycle, this is the time to begin a new routine and really close out the things of the old that are no longer serving us because they aren't. And decide what it is that we want to to do from here. I had a couple interviews the last couple of days, and one of the things we've talked about was the ne- necessity for humankind to realize that though there has been oppression over and over and over again, the cycle has ended and we are at a new cycle, and perhaps this is the time where the oppression ends and the people actually evolve to the next step and that's what I feel is important I think that's totally true Um, I think at a personal level it's an opportunity for us to complete karma 
and to graduate from earth school. The reason that the ancients called it a great year was because they believed that many times souls came in and they wound up having the whole 26,000-year cycle to basically come in, have their experiences, and become enlightened. And if you cleaned up your act, got into the heart, and really were living truthfully in integrity and uh, through higher spiritual law, you had an opportunity to graduate, if you will, from earth school. And um, this is, of course, the whole concept of the fact that these stargates open and that we have a, the Mayans say, a serpent rope descends to Earth. And uh, from that serpent rope comes a being that they call nine winds. Now, that being was always associated with Quetzalcoatl or Kukla Khan. You know, who was Quetzalcoatl or Kukla Khan? Well, for them, it was kind of like their Christ teacher. And so many people believe that this is actually speaking of a prophecy of the return of the Christ, but at the same time, what is the serpent rope? That's a big mystery. And we think that it it could be almost like these plasma energies that are coming down from the great central sun to our galactic center, to our sun, and that because we're all lined up, they can actually arrive on Earth like a stargate opening, and if you've cleaned up your act and truly are living in a place of the heart or Christ consciousness, you can consciously begin to uh, uh, step through those gates uh, or step through that doorway. This is also connected with the teachings of the tree of life because the tree of life, in essence, is the serpent rope. Um, they call it in the Tree of Life the lightning path in which spirit comes down from the worlds of spirit and energy into the worlds of matter. So it's a very unusual time for anybody to be alive on the planet, really a spectacular opportunity. Um, And so, of course, it's not so good for linear thinking. It's not so great for, um, you know... uh, feeling is, let's say, organized or oriented to the normal third-dimensional world, but it's a wonderful opportunity to begin to tune in to these uh, subtle, higher energy realms that I think in the months and the years ahead of us are are going to be uh, more and more uh, consciously a part of this change in society you're talking about. If you look at the ages, you know that the Anunnaki gods who lived for hundreds of thousands of years are the ones who who gave us the zodiac. They gave us most of the arts and sciences that we have. And being alive for so long, they observed the celestial energies of each one of these ages, and they encoded them in certain hermetic symbols. And if you look very carefully at what the symbols are of each one of the signs, you can kind of see what that age is about. So with Pisces, we had the dualism of the two fish. The high end of Pisces, which is ruled by water, is the cosmic Christ. It's the one who merges with the cosmic ocean and realizes you and I all come from the same source and we're all part of the divine, you know, spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and so forth. But the other side, you know, the two fishes swim in two directions, is which way will we go? Will we will we take this and run with it and become spiritually realized, or will we do what we did, which was to become, in the name of Jesus, oppressors with the Inquisition and the Holy Crusades and the destruction of the Knights Templars, the Gnostics, the Cathars, all these really beautiful groups that were wiped away, will we you know, fall into ignorance and darkness. And unfortunately, that's what we did in the Western world, a lot of it. So we didn't do so well with Pisces. So 2012 is the very first year of uh, the one degree of the 72 years or the 2160 years of the age of Aquarius. The the theosophists like Manly P. Hall and Rudolf Steiner, all these guys said that basically we moved into zero degrees of Aquarius in 1939. And so if you add 72 years to 1939, you come to the year 2011, meaning that 2012 would be the very first year of 72 years that would be the first degree of Aquarius. So we're at the very beginning 
Now, Aquarius is an air age. It's ruled by air, which is communication, space travel, technology, cell phones, computers, all these things that we see that, you know, in the last 50 years have just exploded. Um, uh, UFOs, star beings, so forth. So, but it's also, if you look at the image, it's a man or a woman from the stars pouring the waters of wisdom from the stars down onto the earth. So the hermetic symbolism of the, of the age of Aquarius is cosmic connection and oneness where the stargates open, where the wisdom of the star elders returns to the earth where our connection with our own cosmic origins is uh, renewed, and where um, we have an opportunity to, like the serpent rope flowing down. Here's the cosmic waters flowing down to the earth. So uh, the hermetic symbolism is also a unified person. It's not dualistic like Pisces or Gemini. It's... um, the man or the woman, or the androgen. So it it tends to indicate to us that it will become an age of unity, where we balance the male and the female energies within ourselves. And if we can do it within ourselves, then we can start to have societies and civilizations and cultures and religions and governments that begin to reflect the same balance between the male, the female, the inner, the outer. So it's not just, you know, rich people oppressing poor people or men oppressing women or, you know, militaries oppressing peasants or all the kind of dualistic uh, paradigms that we've seen again and again in these earlier ages. Does this make sense to you? It definitely does make sense. Definitely does. And we're early days yet. So, I mean, if you just consider what's happened in the last 50 years, we're in 2013, so we go back, you know, uh, 2003, uh, uh, 1993, 83, uh, 73, 63. Since 1963, how has the world changed? It's, it's light years in 50 years, and this is because the energies of this new age are coming in, and we weren't even one degree into it. So we have a ways to go, and the good news is that the ancients talk about this new age that's coming as the age of illumination, an age of awakening, where we do finally, as a society, uh, get it together, uh, where we're honoring both spirit and matter, male and female, the inner, the outer, the environment and nature, and uh, you know the material needs that we that we have being in a physical body. So it's very hopeful, but it, it, there is going to be some change involved, and a lot of people expect complete revolution or you know everything like ends in a day. And I don't think it's like that. I think it's um, we have a choice. Certainly, it could be worldwide disaster, but I vote for evolution instead of revolution. I vote Absolutely. for you know, wiser choices so that um, we all grow up as a civilization instead of having the change forced upon us from, uh, because we're not paying attention. Wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. We need to definitely pay more attention because if not then you're right changes thrust upon us in ways we don't want and by paying attention we can resolve a lot of that well if you follow some of these other cycles for example pluto has moved into capricorn pluto is the uh, planet uh even though i know it's been demoted who cares it's the same energy uh, the planet of life, death, sex, taxes, deep shamanic initiation, and the great spiritual mysteries. It's literally the planet of transformation. Moving into Capricorn, Capricorn rules governments, corporations, societal structures, and the nature of time. So let's just apply that. We transform the nature of time. We end one age, we begin another. We transform the nature of governments. 
in the last two or three years, we've had, uh, since this is, uh, since Pluto moved into Capricorn, we've had, you know, uh, evolution or revolution in a number of countries around the world, including um, uh, Egypt, um, uh, I think Iran, Iraq, um, all of these. And, of course, even in America, we've had a lot of change in the last four years with Obama uh, upsetting finally the the um, uh, Republican administrations, which were so just so blatantly uh, dreadful. Uh, I hope you don't mind my saying that, but I mean, and although Obama still has you know his own problems where he needs to work on them, and um, we don't really want to go down that path too much. It's it's better than what we had, which was. You know, like, for example, with Mitt Romney, I mean, he's a handsome, good-looking guy, very charismatic, probably a wonderful family man, but his millions were made from buying companies and dismantling them. It wasn't about building anything. It was about um, uh, pirating them. And, you know, I mean, anybody who makes $120 million with just interest for a year is not really in touch with the common people that are struggling on a day-to-day basis to pay their mortgage payments and, you know, just keep their heads above water and put food on the table. So um, despite the fact that he might be a fine individual as a person, uh, you know, all of these change of the old guard, and I think it will continue, but we have to remain vigilant. We can't be complacent mm-hmm. about it. Right. And, and whether it's our own inner spiritual work, discovering who we are, healing our past, working together in communities. You know, as they say, think globally, act locally. I love that the Internet has made it possible for people to have issues, send out a, a one-page, will you sign my petition, and to make a difference by mm-hmm. actually, you know, acting. It doesn't take long to do it, but and we don't have to you know, start a whole organization to do it. We can simply add our voice to the voices of others who support the evolutionary change of a higher consciousness in our world. Absolutely. And, you know, I have seen personally people over the last month change. I've seen people that were closed-minded be a bit more open-minded about subjects now and in many different areas, and it is encouraging to see that because it's a sign that people are waking up. Yeah, I think so, too. You know, I I told you that I do a lot of healing work with people, and um, for any of our listeners who are interested, you know, these soul readings are very profound because I think when the conscious mind um, uh, hears you know, the soul knows who it is, but the conscious mind doesn't because we sort of have amnesia when we come down here. So when the conscious mind uh, hears the knowledge that the soul actually has, it sets up a quickening, if you will, uh, and uh, it really helps a realignment uh, uh, of empowerment to take place. And then when you actually... I, I just had a client that was here for three days... I have another client who came in for five days week before last, and uh, you know we you could, I could only do a couple of sessions a day because it's very very intense work, but um, it's really beautiful. And I'll just speak about one of these clients because of course obviously our listeners don't know who this is, but one of these people she's a, a woman who's 75. She gets up and goes to work every day from 7:30 in the morning till five works very hard, very intelligent, and very good health. Um, her, on the surface, she would never guess who she was as a soul. But uh, in reality, she had been a high priest in Egypt with a great deal of knowledge and wisdom, a transmitter of knowledge, a keeper of sacred records. She went on to study with Pythagoras, so she knew a lot about the structure, the sacred geometry and mathematics of the universe, and the frequencies of tones and sounds. She became a healer in 500 and 800 A.D. as an herbalist and a druid, but of course she was taken out by the Roman Catholic Church and killed. And then she came back as a Christian, uh, one of the Cathars, who were really trying to live according to Jesus' 
word in the south of France in the 1100s, and she was taken out again by the Roman Catholic Church that felt threatened by the Cathars. So then she thought, okay, I can't be a healer. I can't be, you know, a Christian. Uh, she came back as a Jew, a Jewish woman, in the 1300s, and uh, that's a time when the Jews were being killed as well, so they had to all convert to Christianity. But she wanted to study the mystical Kabbalah, or the Tree of Life, and again, her life and her family's life were threatened by her pursuit of knowledge. So she thought, okay, forget religion. So then she came back in the early 1500s uh, as a scientist, a male scientist, and she knew Copernicus. And Copernicus, of course, was one of the first people to put forth the whole theory that the sun was at the center of the solar system and that we were going around the sun, because at that time they believed that since the sun came up and moved across the sky, that we were the center and everything went around us. So she was then arrested as a scientist and, you know, imprisoned for nine months and tortured for five months by, yes, the Catholic Church once again. Um, uh, <laughs> and, of course, it was only a 100 years later that finally Galileo put it forth as an actual truth, and he was imprisoned as well. So as you can imagine, in this lifetime, she was blocked. She couldn't be a healer. She couldn't study you know, um, uh, science, she couldn't, st in every, every direction, male, female, you know, spirituality, Christian, Jewish, all these roads were blocked to her because of the times in which she had incarnated. They were very dark times. She herself was a very highly evolved spiritual soul. But it suddenly explained to her her entire life and how she had been hiding out and, you know, had this deep quest for truth and knowledge and this innate sense of what was what was eternal. But she had chosen a very secular job in the third dimensional world and just uh, hid out so that she wouldn't die again. And so all the work we were doing was literally about healing and clearing each one of those lifetimes so that she could then get on with the happiness and joy and fulfillment of her life in this day and age. And, of course, whatever it is she clears now will be for any subsequent lives she takes. So she's, you know, in good shape. Well, that's, that's quite a journey. Yeah, in three days. <laughs> right. It, it's wow. very fascinating work. And, you know, as you know, I teach and speak all over. So there's the work I do publicly with these really beautiful slideshows and presentations about the mysteries. And um, I did want to mention the mystery school, if it's okay. Is that all right with you? Sure. Well, as you know, uh, about seven years ago, I began to teach a mystery school here in Atlanta. It's called the Phoenix Fire Lodge, the Order of the Eagle and the Dove. And um, I've taught several rounds here in Atlanta. Uh, the first level is 12 classes, and we teach them roughly about a month or six weeks apart when they're here in Atlanta. But when I announced a couple of years ago that I was going to teach another round, and I'm about to send out an email in, in February in my newsletter that I'll be starting to teach a new round because the last students graduated in September of 2012, when... Um, I sent out this notice. All these people wrote me from, you know, New Jersey to Vancouver to San Francisco to to England to Dubai. I, mean, I got emails from all over. Do you have an online program? And I had to say at that time, no, I'm so sorry, I don't. But in the last two years, I've developed a really wonderful online program to teach about these spiritual mysteries. There are 12 of the classes, and they arrive as a PDF via email when people order them. And I think the shortest is 100 pages. Most of them are 150, and there's one that's about 180. But they have all sorts of beautiful images and paintings and um, knowledge and teaching and processes and spiritual exercises in them. And so they're not up on my website quite yet. I'm in the process of getting a new one done but hopefully they will be in the next month or so. Uh, but people who are interested in listening to your show, if they're interested in ordering um, 
if they're interested in the mysteries and a further conversation, they can email me, and I'm happy to send them for free the Introduction to the Mysteries, which is about 65 pages long, and at the back, the last 10 pages kind of give you an overview of the courses. And then if there's something that you are interested in, in going forward with, then you can email me back, and you know I'm happy to talk to you about it on the phone. Um, but if you'd like, I'll give out that email sure. so that people who are interested might be able to take a, a bigger look. Absolutely. Uh, my direct email is Trisha McCannon Speaks at Yahoo.com. So that's T R I C I A McCannon, M C C A N N O N, and then the word Speaks at Yahoo.com. And just put in the subject line, you know, would love the introduction to the mysteries. And then um, I'm happy to try to send it out to you, you know, via email. Excellent. You've written a couple of books so far, one uh, Dialogue with Angels, and the other one is about Jesus and his lost years. And you also have another book coming out. Do you want to talk briefly about your books, the, the ones you've written, and what's coming out? Yes, Dialogue with the Angels has just gone into its fourth printing, and we've added about 100 pages and about 30 illustrations. And, of course, that book opens with the the divas and the angels and the masters and uh, all these very powerful experiences with these uh, spiritual beings that have been teaching me since I was a child. And that book continues to just be such a great heart book. Um, someone just called me yesterday that had gotten it the day before, and in one day she had just finished it, and she was like, I love this book. So it's a great book whether you're a beginner or you're an advanced student, or you're someplace in between, and it's an easy read. Then my second book, as you know, which took me about three years to write, uh, is about the lost years and secret teachings of Jesus and how he is connected with these great spiritual masters and teachers. Uh, and that book has over 100 pages of appendixes and 1,200 footnotes and over 100 illustrations. And uh, it's wonderful. Again, I get letters from people all around the world that say, you know, I've always felt in my heart that these things are true, but I didn't have the evidence. Thank you so much for writing this book and for grounding it in the historical knowledge that has been lost to most of us. So both of those books you can see on my website. Which is now, in the, I'm um, sorry? now in the Now in the book about Jesus, a lot of your information you were able to have access to Vatican records, is that correct? Yes, I got access to some of the 570,000 documents hidden within the Vatican that no one's been allowed to see for over 100 years. And um, I also have uh, secret um, uh, books that have just come to light recently. For example, uh, books that Joseph of Arimathea took with him in 37 AD over to Britain, and they were protected by the early Christian monks and later by the uh, Abbey of Glastonbury. And um, one of those uh, very large volumes of uh, historical documents has been published in the last few years. So it was quite a, a journey, a three-year initiatory journey to write it because um, I wound up really uh, delving into enormous amount of hidden history. It's very honoring to Jesus. And there are people who tell me that they never even liked Jesus or understood him or anything, and they love him after reading the book. Uh, it's it's a profound book, and it's very grounded. And then mm-hmm. this new book that I've just started writing, um, I say I've just started writing, I actually have about 400 pages of it from an uh, earlier draft, but I'm in the process of rewriting, is really about these galactic changes, the changes inside of each one of us, the activation of our spiritual destiny, and um, uh, really awakening to the heart of this new world age. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm, you know, I think there's a lot of ingredients to it, and... Um, you know, I hope that will come out a little later this because I do have a lot of the foundation done for it. I'm I'm home uh a lot of the next month writing before I'm going to Asheville I think in uh, March and then New York in March and April and then San Francisco in April and May. 
so I start traveling again in the spring. And then this summer, I hope to be going to Dominator Italy, and maybe this is all stuff we can talk about on our next um, uh, interview. Sure, absolutely. Well, Tricia, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you very much for being on the show and sharing all of your information with us. It's it's good stuff. Thank you so much. I always love doing your show, Josh. You know, I, I know I didn't give you much of a chance to talk, and as knowledgeable as you are, that's a real shame, but I know we tried to squeeze a lot into an hour, so thank you so much for just letting me go on and on. Oh, sure. I talk all the time. You're the guest, so... Thank you. And yeah. for those who are interested in knowing more, again, my website is www.trishamccannonspeaks.com. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Tricia.